If we didn't know already, we do know who the cash cows in the Big Ten are now. When your spring game is placed on Fox, and yes, Michigan fans, we do know that the next Saturday at noon Eastern, but there it is, Ohio State and Michigan, the next two weekends on Fox for everyone to see. You don't have to go searching for some kind of plus, 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 plus platform to grab your spring game for the Buckeyes. We talk, of course, spring game and all that is Ohio State football for the next 60 right here at the Voice of College Football. Appreciate you stopping by. Right next to me, Tony Gerdeman, Buckeye Huddle. Buckeye Weekly is the podcast. Get on over there. Check it out on a regular basis. Steve Hellwagon, Bucknuts 247 Sports, of course. Guys, how are we doing today? Good. Doing good. You know, before we dive into Ohio State, Ryan Day met with the media this week. News just broke. OJ Simpson. We are talking one of the greatest talents that ever hit a football field. That's one career. Then the celebrity career. And then the horrific, horrendous actions by the man. And it's just... uh, it's one of those things, like for anyone that's old enough that's listening that 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 uh, lived through a certain uh, president or celebrity's death that is of high magnitude, I can think of a couple. And then here we go um, with one of those events that, that if you were around uh, now 30 years ago in June, you remember because he was such a celebrity and the news and the actions playing out on national and international television was so surreal that uh, we all remember it. Yep. I was at uh, a bachelor party in 94, summer of 94. We're watching the NBA finals. I don't remember Houston was playing probably the bulls. I don't know. 94. And uh, they broke into coverage like at the, tail end of an NBA finals game to show the Bronco chase going through Los Angeles with Al Cowling's driving his friend and former teammate driving the Bronco because the police were in pursuit of OJ Simpson to get him in custody. You know, it had been a, a short while since the murders had happened at his house and he had been free for just a short while. I don't know if it was a matter of days or weeks, but the police decided this guy needed to be in custody and they're trying to track him down. He's trying to flee. And uh, they eventually apprehended him at his house. The chase ended at his house and uh, in Brentwood, California, I believe. And then it took them a year and four or five months to go through the trial and it was in October of 95. I'm in interviews at Ohio State. We're talking to John Cooper, who was the head coach, and the verdict came out that he was not guilty. And Mike Vrabel was one of the star players on the Ohio State team at the time, and now, you know, NFL head coach, erstwhile. And he's walking out the door as we're talking to John Cooper, and he just said, Coach, crime doesn't pay, does it? You know, kind of in jest, you know, because no one could really believe that he'd been acquitted of uh, the, the killings of his ex-wife and of the waiter who simply was in the wrong place at the wrong time, brought the glasses back from the restaurant for uh, OJ's ex-wife and uh, was killed uh, you know, on the spot, presumably by OJ. He was acquitted in the criminal trial, but uh, was uh, found liable in the civil trial, a $30 million judgment and, uh, you know, just uh, a terrible thing for their family and the, the country witnessed it and everything else. And, of course, you know, all this belies the fact he was one of the greatest football players who ever lived. I mean, you know, college at USC, uh, Ohio State defeated USC in the 1968 Rose Bowl, the Super Softs. And after the game, O.J. Simpson had like an 80-yard touchdown run in that game. And Woody Hayes pulled uh, Lou Holtz, who was the secondary coach aside, and said, of course, this is Lou Holtz's version. You know, how, why, why did O.J. Simpson just run for 80 yards against us? And Lou Holtz, you know, on the banquet circuit years later would say, well, Coach, that's all he needed. So, <laughs> you know, like we, we weren't going to stop him. But they did win the game 27-16. to 16, And as lore has it, uh, O.J. came in the Ohio State locker room and saluted the Buckeyes 
uh, after the the 27 to 16 win. One of the great wins in Ohio State football history. Obviously, was a star with the Buffalo Bills years later, and uh, then NBC commentator, and uh, did that up until the time he was obviously on trial uh, for the murder of, the, of his wife. So. That's uh, kind of my op- long and short on OJ, my remembrances of where I was uh, during the the car chase and when the verdict came down. And, uh, you know, my comment today, I said to these guys as we signed in, he died 30 years too late. Yeah, I remember watching the verdict. I think I ended up being, we ended up being late for class just because everybody was so invested in it. And, I think the that trial is part of the reason cable news is as big as it is today. Like that, the the, the ratings and the wall to wall coverage led to so many more things. Before that, it was like Iran Contra and Baby Jessica, <laughs> and then OJ it took over. But my my first remembrances of him, I never saw him as a player. So it was NBC and Naked Gun, and. And, uh, you know, the contrib- contributions as Nordberg, you know, were tainted, obviously, greatly by uh, the, the, uh, the everything that went on before after that. But, yeah, I never watched him as a player, never saw him as a player. People talk about, uh, you know, I, I saw Eric Dickinson late, later in his career, and he was, like, really, really good, one of the best I ever saw. And people would compare him to OJ. But, um, you know, obviously aware of – his contributions to football and uh, much worse contributions in many other ways. Kevin, welcome to the show. Welcome thank you, thank to you. a topic you probably may or may not have anticipated. I'll say this briefly before we let Kevin chime in on the death of OJ Simpson. My first recollection of OJ, so Steve and I are the same age, so I missed his career from a football standpoint. I have the type personality that one second I knew nothing about the NFL, nothing about football. I was not exposed to it. My family, nothing. And then once I got exposed to it, like I'm reading every statistic, memorizing it, watching every game, all that. So I just missed like he just blew out his knee. He's going to have a big transition of his career to San Francisco from Buffalo. And he went from being like the best to done, like third of a season and done. Uh, pretty much that like he had like a 17 yard run in his last game. And I've never seen one play so blown up as like, this was his one last burst of greatness. We'll never see it. He's done by, uh, but I remember at Thanksgiving. So this might've been 1977, just getting into the NFL. I'm at, I'm at a friend's house and the, the father of another family points him out to me and says, that is the greatest football player on the planet right there. We're watching him run for 250 yards against the Lions. And so I just barely got a glimpse of OJ. But then, yes, as Tony alluded to, it was just this celebrity of just, you know, he had the smile, he had the charisma, he's doing the Hertz commercials, he's on NBC doing the games, and you just, I, I wasn't like this huge fan, but I just kind of looked at him as this just all-American hero. He's just, he was... Mm-hmm. Just that just shining of a uh, individual, apparently. And then all that came down in my first thoughts, again, not being any kind of huge fan was, no, 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 he, hopefully he didn't do it. Hopefully this is not right. Hopefully this just looked, but it only took a few days before I'm like, wow, this is, this is horrific and he needs to get what's coming to him. And then we all saw it play out, Kevin. Yeah, I missed watching his NFL career. His last year, I just pulled up Wikipedia, which is never wrong. <laughs> I just pulled up Wikipedia on, on getting dates like this right. It's it's generally right. Um, I started watching the NFL around 79, so I did not see his career. I'm sure Hertz is flying compact cars at half mast right now because let's not forget he was also a pitch man for Hertz. And really my, I mean, obviously the Naked Gun movies were very formative in my very crude and potty sense of humor, but uh, I also was an associate producer at the local ABC affiliate here in Columbus, and we did a weekday daily show on the trial. 
and I was a young AP, which basically meant I was doing all the Charlie work out there. Um, I had to listen to the answering machine, which essentially it was, as people would call in and leave their feedback about how they thought the trial was going or whatever else. And it was a simpler time back then, and people probably would not be as openly toxic as they are these days. But, uh, whoa, boy, I did listen to some humdingers back in the day about uh, how people felt on that one. I didn't even know that he was he was dealing with cancer. I mean, once in a blue moon, ever since he got out of uh, prison, he would make some post about something from the golf course, and I would listen. I'm like, oh, Juice, what are you doing? Uh, wake up this morning and I read about it and, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's something, but, uh, you know, I don't think there'll be any shortage of opinions on how people feel about the man, but one thing we can all agree upon 76 years old, OJ Simpson has gone to the next chapter of his existence, but will live in infamy in the history books. No doubt. Yeah. Just a complete, uh, career and then into a a life and actions that are unprecedented, fortunately. Okay, let's move on to Ohio State football in the here and now in 2024. Tony, we'll start with you. You jumped on first in regards to Ryan Day meeting with the media and what uh, stood out to you. Then we'll go Steve and Kevin. I, th I think what stood out to me is nobody asked about Jeremiah Smith, and uh, that's just a shame. It, there are so many questions and so little time that uh, follow-ups weren't weren't recommended, but there was a ton of talk about Julian saying, and while there's this quarterback competition going on, mainly between Devin Brown and Will Howard and, uh, and also Lincoln Keenholz, the topic of conversation has been Julian saying gets his black stripe off faster than any other quarterback at Ohio State uh, since the, the thing started back in 2012. And just he's been producing, playing well in practice, and so I don't expect him to be in the mix uh, as a legitimate starter. Even though Ryan Day did say he's been in the mix in the competition, that's that's what he's going to say. Um, just a, a lot of attention there because he's playing well, but I think the focus is still going to be on Will Howard and Devin Brown. Uh, the other concern, just a right guard, they're still moving people in and out there and have finally started to – get a look at Carson Hinsman and Seth McLaughlin there at that spot. And, you know, one of them's at center, one of them's at guard. Uh, so I think that will eventually shake out. He did say that they're going to look at all options, which could also include the transfer portal after the spring for that spot. Steve. Yeah. I thought uh, that uh, coach day uh, was asked about the, the new running backs coach, Carlos Lachlan and said that, uh, they interviewed 10 or 12 people by Zoom, narrowed it down to four people, and that it was very clear that Carlos Lachlan, who only has like three years of on-field coaching experience, was clearly the guy. And Lachlan was very impressive when we got a chance to talk to him yesterday. So that was one. Uh, I think that <laughs> this was in our internal text chain uh, of us, you know, we try to crack each other up. Somebody made the comment that uh, Coach Day was very much saying how they're going to need multiple quarterbacks because they are going to run the quarterbacks this year. And then in parenthesis, the part that's not said is they're going to get the quarterbacks injured this year by running the quarterbacks. So uh, necessitating the need for two or three quarterbacks. So I think in their perfect world, they would keep this triumvirate of Howard Brown and Sayin all in the fold uh, through the end of the, the upcoming season. Because as Coach Day said, the last time we won one here at Ohio State, and uh, he and Chip Kelly were probably somewhere in the NFL at that point, uh, we had to have three guys doing it. And, uh, you know, that was obviously the case, you know, when they had to go three quarterbacks deep in that 2014 season. So, uh he wants, uh, and I don't think that's an indictment of any of them that they haven't won the job or anything. I think they're all playing at a high level, and I think that they feel like they could win with any of them is kind of the gist that I get. Um, it says that Howard's experience has given him a little bit of a leg up perhaps, but uh, Brown and Sayin are right there is what it, what it reads to me. 
And I think it'll be very interesting. Those first three games, uh, it's Akron, Marshall, and some other schlub. Uh, it's going to be in inter- Is it Middle Tennessee? Is that who they're playing? Does that sound right? I don't even remember. I don't think it's middle, but I don't. I don't is it Western? Even, yeah, it's it's a directional MAC school or something. Yeah, some, and Akron some, and Marshall. Yeah, Marshall, Will, and Holly, the land of the lost. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting in those three games to see who plays, how much, and how well they do. I think that those will be barometers in, in kind of the decision making as then they weed into Big Ten play after that. And he very much said that Saiyan is a guy who's working toward being somebody who they go on the road to Oregon and rely on him, go on the road to Penn State, and he helps them win a game. And uh, the team up north game in Columbus and then playing for the Big Ten Championship, playing for the National Championship, that uh, that's what uh, they're hoping, you know, is uh, he's got a bright future. And, and that those are the kind of things he needs to show that he can be the guy that could lead him in those tough games. So, you know, point A to point B, they're they're just going down the first baseline with with some of these guys. And, uh, you know, we'll see uh, see how it turns out. I don't know how Mark expects me to remember anything that happened 23 hours ago. Um, I think I think Steve and Tony have hit a lot of the high points of what Ryan had to say, or at least what was taken away in his 27 minutes or so yeah. uh, of, of, of talking to us, the final conversation that we will have prior to the spring game, an event that, you know, we don't necessarily have all of the details hammered out, but we do, kind of, it's going to be, a case of the ones will go out there and will not will play more of a thud style of football. They will put them all in bubble wrap or knocker balls or something to keep them from getting hurt and then let everybody else tackle. And then the fourth quarter will be a running clock and punch and pie will be had by all after the event is over. Um, I was waiting to see if we were going to get any indications of you know, some of these rumored transfer move, uh, moves, some that are, have merit and some that don't, the ones having merit, Dallin Hayden, he wasn't necessarily going to get into that whole situation. The ones that don't hold merit, Lincoln Keen holds to Iowa. Uh, you know, I, I just think that it's a case of they're starting to really see what the picture is going to look like post spring. And you only are going to get a small part of the picture. Um, you're not going to know a lot of things there, but, uh, you know, I'll be curious to see as soon as the portal opens, what happens with offensive line. I've been telling people that I think that the move is not necessarily going to be going out and getting a frontline starter at a tackle or a guard spot. I think what Ohio state needs to do more of is get somebody who has a couple of years, go out and get a Josh Simmons who doesn't have to be thrust right out there in year one and get somebody who gives you a little bit more depth because, you know, this may be an unpopular uh, opinion, but it's mine. Uh, I feel one, yeah, well, I'm pretty unpopular, but I feel fine from one to five, six, seven, and eight, I have more concern about. And I think that if you can get somebody in there to help affect six, seven, or eight, that is going to carry a lot more weight for the immediacy. And to Steve's point, if Ohio State is planning on injuring a bunch of quarterbacks, they'll probably lose a couple of linemen along the way too. So six, seven, and eight are going to be very important. It's going to be a long season. 17 games, 16, 17. So, Kevin, back to your transfer portal philosophy of sorts. So I think a lot of people out there, whether they have legitimate platforms or not, have some level of platform and they tend to say, uh, here's a weakness, here's an opportunity here, here's a player over here who is buried on the depth chart at that particular position. I'm going to connect the two and then I'm going to phrase it in such a way that makes it actually sound like there is actual contact and interest between those two parties. Uh, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, I think they should go get him or that type of player, that position, because they need it. Uh, but people have been making that connection, Lincoln Keenholz to Iowa. So you're telling us there's nothing other than people's speculation that Iowa could use a quarterback. This guy's really good, and he's buried on the depth chart. I will read from a very good friend of mine 
who is a preeminent source at Iowa, and I quote, zero truth to it. Iowa has no idea where it came from, end quote. I don't know what else I have to say at that point. It angers me that such a horseshit rumor has carried as much weight as it has. Because it's not fair to the kids at this point. Um, yes, they're getting paid. I mean, yes, you know, they're blurring the line between amateurism and professionalism. And you're, you're opening yourselves up to more, more talk and everything else. But it's not as if this thing has, the, the, the genesis of this rumor has come even from an ancillary sort of I've heard of person or, or organization or whatever. It's just the proliferation of, of, of white noise from social turning, turning falsehoods into, into truths. And, and then, you know, I'm sure Lincoln Keenholz is having to sit there and answer stuff or, you know, maybe, you know, not from us, we're not going to get to talk to him, but from people around him and everything else. And it just, we're, we're only a couple of weeks away from, from the portal. Keep your panties on, everybody. I mean, we're, it's going to get wild here. We're going to see names entering the portal at various schools everywhere that we're not expecting or whatever. But, you know, let's slow our roll. I, the um, When Caden Proctor le- announced he was leaving Iowa and going back to Alabama, then everybody was like, you know, is Caleb Downs leaving? And there are rumors out there. And – there are people from Alabama contacting, trying to get any truth to that. Like, is this, is this true? Is this really happening? It's like, wouldn't you know if it was, wouldn't you as Alabama know if this was really happening? So, um, and, and the thing is though, the portal breeds this social media breeds it. And it's kind of the, the world we're in right now. And there are, there are a bunch of accounts out there where it's frustrating, where you're, you're trying to, um, you know, you're just doing your job and then you got people hitting you in DMs. Hey, have you seen this? Is this real? Is this that and this? And I, I tell people, if you just look at the source, go, you can, you can find a lot of, you can do a lot of research on Twitter just by doing a Twitter search and seeing how far something goes back. And generally you can find the starting point of, of many rumors. And if um, they're started by troll accounts or, you know, 122 followers and, um, you know, you look at some of their replies and their tweets and it's just all trash to bashing people and things like that. You can sort of understand, okay, no truth there. Um, so the, the, it gets a little frustrating dealing with stuff like that, but it, it is, it is what it is. And so, um, you know, there's going to be more rumors and, and the thing is there, there are going to be so many, so many rumors this spring with the portal that, I don't know. I don't want to say it's almost safer to de- to believe them because it's not, but there are going to be some rumors that are unbelievable that will actually absolutely be true. Before Steve jumps in, I just want to say this. I It forces legitimate organizations and personalities to have to address them because they gain so much, so much steam behind them that you have to come out and, and write an article or make a message board post or do a show or whatever. And we all have enough stuff to do. We don't have to go out and go snipe hunting. Slash end of rant. <laughs> yeah. You know, Lincoln would be within his rights to, to see what else, what's out there. And you wish, you know, tampering and everything else is involved in things like this. Guys who haven't entered the portal are not supposed to be contacted and these type things. So, um, you know, I guess you just kind of look at it and, and, uh, you know, take it all with a grain of salt. And uh, I guess we'll see what happens when spring springs over and uh, the portal opens and uh, guys can jump in. So I guess we'll we'll find out next week where things are at. I mean, I don't expect Ohio State to be carrying five quarterbacks going into fall. Probably not. But this, you know, Keen holds to Iowa and somebody posted in the chat, why there? Well, I guess... When you grow up in South Dakota and you're you're in Ice Station Zebra, I mean Iowa is somewhat close. Iowa certainly has the need for quarterbacking. Uh, Cade McNamara has not been able to stay healthy, so we don't know what that might look like, and we certainly don't know what a 
what whatever the opposite of apocalyptic, whatever this era looks like for Iowa with the departure of Brian Ferentz, uh, you know, maybe it becomes a little bit more of a quarterback destination. I mean, I guess anything is more than zero, but uh, you know, I just I I don't I don't get it. And if you're a Wiseman, I would just stay away from this one. I will say, um, go ahead, Tony. Uh, League of Kenos at one time uh, committed to Kalen DeBoer in Washington, but I'm not. I'm not kicking anybody into the portal. I just w- wanted to throw that out there, just to um, DeBoer's revenge. Chum in the water. He's a better thrower than Jalen Milrow. I'll just say that right now. My uh, last little slice on this, going back to the more big topic picture of what Kevin addressed is I will put some level of responsibility, although there are all sorts of all sorts of uh, non-credible sources and platforms and YouTube channels. You know, go back to what Rick Riley once said when I was at a luncheon with him, and he said, the great thing about the Internet is everybody's got a platform, and the horrible thing about the Internet is everybody's got a platform because knuckleheads are out there that have no idea what they're talking about or not journalists in any such way. I do not promote myself to be a journalist, but I was at one time, so I know the approach. Uh, I I will put it at the feet of the viewer and the listener, though, at times, because we've all been victim to, you did not listen to what I presented. You did not listen. You looked at a title or you heard a name here and a name here, and then you, you were not listening. You were not paying attention. I did not say that. I did not report that. Nothing of that. Okay. Well, I mean, really quick. The thing is, is that if if you do a show that is based on engagement, which what we're doing here on YouTube or what's on ABC, or I mean, it, you want viewership, so you have to address the stuff that's out there. But having to amplify these things sucks because you know you you don't know where it's coming from and you i mean so you well we're going to talk about it or whatever but it's 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 a vicious cycle and you know i had to stand outside with in the with the dog in the rain for 10 minutes earlier while she was deciding if she wanted to go to the bathroom or not so i'm already in a bad mood but um you know just i have had to answer the keenholz question no less than 200 times in the last week and it just it takes away from my opportunity to do any anything that is based in fact if you end up having to do a show about it that's a show that you're wait you're having to do a show on something that may do crazy numbers or whatever but it's going to be looked back upon it's like well you know at least we did crazy numbers there even though it was you know perky you know 41 41 that put this thing out there and he's fos since I've already hit my quota of 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 swear bombs that I can drop on the show, uh, he he's FOS. I just it it just cheapens everything. I would like to uh, reallocate my uh, curse words over to Kevin. <laughs> so, well, Steve uses most of mine through through <laughs> other weeks. So I had I had to get in first. Nah. Steve is the all-time leader, I guess. Yeah, I've That's dropped right. a couple in my you're, day. You're still way under the, the quota. People people overestimate my quota. Duh. Yakov, appreciate you being here. <laughs> Saying, as in Julian, has similar build to Joe Montana just saying. That's an interesting one because I've had people ask me, like, just yesterday, give me a comp for him. And I was trying to come up with something physically, body body wise, and I said Stetson Bennett, and people didn't like that. Uh, but I think the Joe Montana thing is really interesting uh, because they're both, you know, Joe Montana. I think uh, it was like six to two hundred ish, and nothing special. Julian's saying now probably close to like two ten, six one, and and does not look like you're strapping NFL quarterback. But that's why Joe Montana was, you know, the third rounder and. Of course, going to Notre Dame didn't help. You know, you don't throw the ball there. Uh, but that's that's a pretty interesting one, and I'm not going to get into the com- comparing the, 
the pocket awareness, which Julian's saying is pretty good at, and the, the mobility in terms of getting finding room to throw the ball. But I do. I when I saw that, I um I did like that comparison, at least in terms of the build. Saying to me, you know, you see the picture of him getting his black stripe taken off, and here's Devin Brown on one side, and Will Howard on the other. He kind of looked like I said Baker Mayfield, kind of standing in the middle. And, you know, if he turns out like Baker Mayfield, I think everybody would be happy, although Baker Mayfield, to my recollection, never did win the national championship at Oklahoma, but uh, still an uh, outstanding player. So, you know, what we're finding out is to win these uh, all-elusive national championships, you got to be great on offense, defense, and special teams. And Ohio State has had one of the three in uh, each of the last several seasons, but never all three uh, together at one point. So uh, maybe uh, maybe this will be the year where they put it all together. <clears throat> I boycott doing comps just because I, I'm never – I'm never good at them, and it's just so difficult to do them. So I, I just, I learned very, you know, a long time ago just to stop doing them. Well, besides uh, the punch in the party after the game or the scrimmage, Kevin, what else do you want to see on Saturday? I'm going to be interested to see how they go about allotting some of the reps. I mean, we know that the Trevion Hendersons of the world will be in there during the thud period, and that'll be about it. You know, let me let me see what we determine the second team secondary. I mean, obviously, guys like uh, Jermaine Matthews and Malik Hartford are, are known quantities, but where do things kind of go from there? Does Does Ohio State go? Super vanilla, one, because you're not going to put a lot of complex things in there just due to teaching time, two, because you don't want to put a lot of stuff on tape, or does Ohio State go the other direction and just go nuts and just like, all right, well, we've, we've, got, a te- we've got a team that we feel that can do everything, so we're going we're gonna to give everybody who's watching this on Big Fox, not, you know, not, not a regional Fox, not FS1, on Big Fox, an opportunity to see us go out and try a lot of these things. It doesn't mean, you know, when you do gadget plays and things like that, it doesn't, you know, you don't have a hundred percent completion rate. And if you're Ohio state special teams, you have a 0% completion rate. Uh, I'll be, I'll be curious to see how, how close to vanilla they, they, they play some of these things. And again, I really, I want to see what, what linebacker looks like beyond Cody beyond Sonny, beyond CJ. I want to see Gabe Powers. I want to see some, I want to see a little bit more out of that position because for whatever reason, the couple of practices they've let us see, they they kept linebacker so far away from us. I have I have I have zero comments about linebacker with my own eyes because I've not been able to see anything. Steve, anything on Saturday that you're looking out for? Yeah, a lot of the same things. I think offensive line rotations and what that looks like and how good that looks. You want to see clean pocket, let the guys make plays. Obviously, of course, you're also rooting for the defense if you're an Ohio State fan and you want to see them make plays as well. But uh, really what held this team back last year was the offensive line. So if the offensive line can show – a level of competence in this game. And I don't know how exotic things will get with blitzes and different things like that. They threw the chi- the kitchen sink at them the day we were there for the student appreciation. They were bringing corner blitzes, safety blitzes, linebacker blitzes, <clears throat> and different uh, pass rush uh, <clears throat> schemes at the offensive line. And they weren't handling them <clears throat> all that well. So, that's what I want to see. I want to see some competence up front. Uh, they talked about the two tackles, how Josh Simmons is now comfortable with the offensive scheme. He had the physical attributes last year, but uh, didn't, you know, was not completely confident. You could tell how tentative he was with the false starts and the different things that happened. And by the end of the year, he was a, a little bit better player than he was at the beginning. And then Josh Fryer, they talked about with him uh, leaning up. Uh, and that, that means like getting lean, not eating, you know, watching his diet, improving his footwork, improving his agility. 
And he had the mastery of the offense. He just didn't have the athletic tools to, to contain a speed rusher at times. So uh, they talked about those two guys, how they've taken a, a full step forward, and and that's great. Uh, what's left unsaid is whether next week they're going to be out there scouring in the uh, portal for another Josh Simmons type uh, in the aftermarket to uh, come in and make the offensive line even better. So, uh, you know, good right now. Great is what they need. So we'll we'll see uh, see how it plays out. I I want to I want to see Jeremiah Smith do something so that everybody gets to see what we've seen and what we've been told about, and so that you can see the excitement there. Um, but that's also a, if if that happens, you there's already a ton of hype. So sometimes can there be too much hype? To, can this be too much for a player like with Julian saying getting his black stripe? I asked Ryan Day, is that is there a danger in doing that in terms of you've got other guys in the room and they're seeing this happen and he said like, they already know like they, they see the they see they're in every practice they know what guys are doing um but if you know I'd like to see Jeremiah Smith go off so that everybody can see that um it's not just been bloviation or we're just hyping somebody up like this he's been special from what we've seen and what we've all been told so seeing that um obviously we're all going to decide who the starting quarterback is based on how Devin Brown and Will Howard do. And, and God forbid they struggle and Julian Sand lights it up because the, the next six months or whatever, four or five, six months before camp starts uh, is going to be, um, it's going to be a lot of talk about a freshman quarterback, which I guess, again, good for numbers. So, Hey, go for it. I guess if Chip Kelly understands the entertainment value of the spring game, they'll throw like 48 fades to Jeremiah Smith in the corner, hoping that there are some poorly thrown passes and he can do something crazy. I, well, that's a pretty interesting thought because this is going to be the biggest spring game that Chip Kelly has ever been a part of. You know, they've already got 50,000 tickets sold. They're expecting it's going to be like 65 and sunny. So no reason you can't get to 90,000. You know, Just bring a windbreaker or whatever. Bring a jacket. But he, I wonder, like, will he get caught up in it as well? I just want to say this, too, that just get ready for the overreactions coming out of this. If the offense looks really good, it's because the defense sucks. If the defense looks really good, it's because the offense sucks. There is there is no combination where you can have the slider set to where it's like everybody's going to be happy. I mean, it could be 50-50 down, I mean, like 50.00000000 down the middle. It's like, well, both units suck. I mean, so I'm, I'm, I'm here for the overreactions. Yeah, somebody responded to something I had to say on X slash Twitter the other day with that, are, are you kidding me? This offense isn't going to be anything close to, and then they listed a bunch of Buckeye greats, Ezekiel Elliott be one of the most recent ones. And I said, well, everyone you're naming was not that guy at the point that the season started uh, in all those seasons that you just cited. And the year after, you know, 2015, when Ezekiel Elliott was a known quantity, that offense was not good. So, um, and Curtis Samuel started a game at running back in 2014 before Ezekiel Elliott took off as a true freshman. So, um, yeah, it's, well, nobody's as good as the greats. And it's like, well, like you said, Mark, nobody was calling them the greats. Nobody called 2014 the great team until they actually won it all. And it was like, can't believe I can't believe they just got away with this. Now, now they are one of the all-time greats. Two thousand two, too. I mean, Unless if you're talking about getting no, away with it, uh, I, saw, I saw a Michigan post of somebody today where they were listing the all-time great teams, and Michigan teams somehow made like four of the top seven slots, along with the you know the the great Miami teams, and it was like, now come on. Were these teams from like the 19 Dickities? I mean, yeah, they were in there too. Sure. Seriously. 2023 was the greatest team of all time. Yes. Well, they're trying to say this Connecticut team that we just saw win the national championship was one of the greatest teams of all time. And, you know, they're great, but, you know, they've been better, no doubt. I mean, I know this isn't a Connecticut show or a basketball show, but I mean, I kind of want to fight people on that one. They were, they were the best team hands down this year. This year, yeah. But 
there was such a chasm between where UConn was and everybody else. It doesn't mean that this UConn team was in the pantheon of all-time great teams. They were no. just better than a bunch of lukewarm dog spit this year that we saw. Yeah, out. yeah, I agree. And here we are. Big, big, it will be a full quarter century between drinks of water for the Big Ten and men's basketball. So, oh, well, what can we eh, do? We got Maryland. And here's here I saw somebody, Jim Rome, did a thing with Izzo yesterday. And I think his comments were, I hate the transfer portal. I don't like NIL. And I'm like, if I'm Michigan State, I'm like, hey, bro, you know, <laughs> we got to embrace what's happening in 2025 and not live in 1997. And, you know, uh, you know, the way things were is no longer the way things are. And either you embrace it and update your methods to what's going to work in 2025, or you got to go. I mean, it just take your pick. I mean, he's on national radio. The toothpaste is out of the tube. There is nothing they can do to restrict transfers for the rest of time. It is done. The courts decided it, or at least they got an injunction against it and will probably win on the merits whenever it comes up. Because you can't, if you have Joe, you know, Smith, who's just a regular undergrad, and he can go to Ohio University for one semester and then go to Ohio State University the next semester and then Cincinnati the, the following year. You can't restrict a student athlete just because of that, just because on the basis of competitive uh, whatever, you know, for college athletes, I just, you know, th that they lost that battle. They lost this whole thing when they didn't. The moment California put that law in place five years ago was when the NCAA needed to circle the wagons and say, we got to reconfigure our um, paradigm. And they didn't do that. And uh, instead, they said, no, we're going to continue to, at Ohio State, collect $275 million, disperse it among scholarships, and pay for all these uh, administrators, coaches, trainers, nutritionists, janitors, et cetera, et cetera, buildings, et cetera, et cetera, and not give the athletes a dime of real cash money. Uh, that's when you fumbled the football, boys. That that's the, that was the day you fumbled the ball. And uh, – that model and the toothpaste is all out of the tube. To Steve's point, he was talking about the Bear Alexander plan of a different school every year, but then it came out in the walk back that he wasn't going to leave USC. Once again, bringing this all full circle, talking about horse bleep rumors out there and everything else. But um, yeah, if you if 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 you're a talking head and. Here we are, four floating heads here on the screen right now. So I guess we're all talking heads as well. But if you're a talking head out there, you don't you don't have to like NIL. You don't have to like the transfer portal. But if you are just, you know, if, if you can't do a show about it because you're just so anti that, then you're the you're a problem. I mean, you're just a crotchety old fart, and just you need to find something else to do. I mean, I think. You know, there are certain aspects of, of, of the transfer portal that I don't like. I've always been very big into player empowerment. I don't have an issue with NIL. I don't particularly like the lawless system we have in place right now. But I don't want to get back to the way of, you know, the old Jim Delaney laundry money conversation or anything else like that. Oh, here's a roll of quarters, kid. Be able to go wash your skivvies. Um, but, you know. Steve mentioning the name Jim Rome is the first time I've heard the name Jim Rome in probably four years. Yeah, he's kind of, kind of in the witness protection program where he used to be like the preeminent guy in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, you know, an example with Ohio State basketball is Roddy Gale. He went from four points a game to 13 points a game working with Jake Diebler and, you know, Holtman, whoever. They got his best basketball out of him. He's not a great three-point shooter, but he somehow gives them 13 points, some decent defense, sometimes five or six rebounds. And, you know, this coach, Jake Diebler, pushed him to the moon. And, you know, the season ends and he goes into the portal. And then you're just kind of like, where are you going to find more money in NIL in a better situation in a team that's on the come any better than Ohio State, and a coach who believes in you and pushed you to the moon, I mean, who recruited you out of high school 
and you're turning your back on all that, I, I don't see the purpose or the point to it. I understand you want to look around. Okay, St. John's can offer me 300,000. Can you guys offer me 350? You know, I get, you know, you want, you want full price for your services. He may get out there and find that there was no better place than Ohio State. And maybe like Bryson Rogers did in football, turn around and say, I want to come back to Ohio State. And then it'll be on Jake Diebler to figure out if he's still got a spot for him. But, um, you know, I just, the short sightedness of some of these decisions, you just sit here and you just, you just scratch your head like what why what what are you looking for what do you want you two already have it. two words you on that one have. third uncle that one is a third uncle situation I, I you will not change my mind on that one third uncle i thought the two words are going to be more money more money more money more money no it has to be money related but you know mm -hmm. ohio state theoretically should be able to give him whatever he wants or needs i mean you know, you'd think, but whatever. I mean, hell, the guy that wouldn't play him two years ago until the very, very, very end is gone and has been cast into the pit of basketball obscurity at DePaul. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it is what it is. Hopefully not obscure, starting on Monday is our Wake Up College football show. And folks, if I put five or ten minutes into reforming our logo, colors, background, and hmm. finding a nice little sunny sunshine guy in the corner, you know it's it's a big deal. So join us at uh, 8 a.m. Eastern Time, starting on Monday, where we will be spreading rumors. No, we won't. No. Just kidding. I'm out. I'm out. You don't get up at eight o'clock anyway, Kevin. So you are definitely out. I, I sometimes go I, to bed at eight o'clock. <laughs> I don't either, but this is going to force me out of bed by seven fifty-five. So it'll be a little bit different of a a show, folks. But just we do will the show from bed. Scanning this, yeah, that 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 would be. I have never done a podcast while still laying in bed be. ever. I swear. <laughs> A lot of people are out there uh, pretty successful on YouTube these days, uh, you know, shooting the, their mm. bedroom and their all sorts of things. That's not on YouTube. That's on those dirty sites. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Where do we go from here? Well, we just have a few minutes left. Steve, we'll start with you. What's going on at Bucknuts? Well, get ready for the spring game, obviously, on Saturday. Uh, it's going to be on Fox at noon Eastern time, which uh, is the first time a college football spring game will be on network television. And it'll be interesting to see what kind of rating that draws and uh, for a glorified scrimmage. And, and as I've said, uh, th this should be a two-hour infomercial for Ohio State's way of life, basically, and why it is the preeminent college football program in the country now that Nick Saban has left Alabama. So uh, to me, I think that's uh, that would be the mission. If I'm uh, Ryan Day and the handlers at Ohio State, Ross Bjork, that's the, the message I would want conveyed out there. Seems like the weather's going to be nice. And, uh, you know, Urban Meyer is going to be talking up Ohio State for two hours in the in the in the broadcast booth. So that'll be fun. So there'll be a lot of yuck, yuck, I'm sure, with Urban and Ryan Day probably talking while the plays are going on at various times as well. And uh, that's what we're looking forward to. We'll be all over that. Um, our guys will be at the practice tomorrow. I'm not able to be there. I've got uh, a funeral for a family friend who passed away, but uh, I will uh, rely on our cohorts to, to attend the practice and, and uh, get all that information. We'll have some stuff previewing the spring game up here. In the next day or so, Patrick Murphy and Dave Biddle and myself are going to do a podcast tomorrow afternoon, the Bucknuts Happy Hour, to kind of preview the game. And uh, we'll get to it on Saturday. That's uh, all we can do. So um, looking forward to it. And then uh, we go into the, the long three-month offseason, uh, mid-April to mid-July, till the Big Ten meetings pop up there in mid-July. And We'll be looking and hunting and searching for things to talk about in the next three months. So there you go. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, mm. Pat and I knocked out all the positions, both sides of the football folks. Check out those videos right here. Kevin, what's going on with you? Yeah, I'm going to be getting ready for the Friday uh, 
opportunity to go and watch practice, but can't video, can't photo. So I'm planning on creating an interpretive dance of what I've seen from Friday's event. So hmm. I may or I may or may not put that up on the Big Me kickoff on Friday. How about uh, not? Probably not. He's right. Uh, Me and Ben, uh, Kevin's interpretive thing. I don't know which is worse. Uh, um, you've completely knocked me off my train of thought there. But uh, out, outside of that, going to have a lot of a lot of post spring practice observation type things that'll be coming out. Uh, you know, starting to get some ideas there, and then lo and behold. We are almost to the time of the year where Mark Gibbler and I will be going on Buckeye Huddle Southern Swing, uh, hoping to start having some more information to share with the public soon on that. But as you know, we don't telegraph too much of our moves uh, on that because we're generally making it up as we go along. But uh, all this great recruiting coverage coming up at BuckeyeHuddle.com. And you can, of course, catch that all over at BuckeyeHuddle.com and YouTube.com slash BuckeyeHuddle. Tony, just uh, right before we jumped on here, finished recording a bold prediction show for the spring game. So I'll get that dropped at some point today. Um, we'll have a, a live show, I think, Kevin, probably after practice tomorrow around 1130 ish. So um, let everybody know what we saw there at YouTube.com slash Buckeye Huddle, like Kevin said. Um, just I actually wrote a piece today uh, talking with uh Carlos Lachlan talking about Ohio State and why Ohio State and and uh, the process of um, getting that job. So that's up at BuckeyeHuddle.com right now. I'm going to write some quarterback stuff and a notebook or two as well in the next day or so. I'm trying to figure out if the boldest predictions for a spring game would be the very boldest of the year or the weakest of the year. I, I don't know which where I would stand. So people check that out with Tony. Yeah, it's it's not easy. You had to pull up like the last five box scores to see exactly what is bold. And uh, I'll tell you what, there, there, there's some Jeremiah Smith discussion in there. So we don't hold back. I've got uh, one other thing. Uh, our site Bucknuts partnered with the foundation, one of the NIL partners with Ohio State to do a spaces uh, interview with Ryan day today. And that'll be archived and put up on our site for people to listen to here this afternoon. He fielded uh, fan questions for about 30 minutes today uh, on a, a, you know, this is a new technology for me. I really haven't been involved in a lot, but on X and Twitter, they have a, a thing called spaces, which basically is like a live podcast situation. And uh, Dave Biddle, another guy fielded, posted questions for coach day and he sat there and, and, and ripped through them. So some interesting stuff. You can check that out at Bucknuts later today. Jackson is telling everyone wake up college football is way better than the crappy morning shows on television. Jackson has apparently seen the uh, pilot show that's been released on YouTube. The pilot episode. Yes. Thank you for that, Jackson. Your faith in me is astounding. Uh, we're going to go live next uh, over on the national channel and talk OJ's greatness from 50 years ago, his persona and his deplorable, despicable last 30 years. Is it 30? Yes, it's 30 as of June. So all the complicated mess that that is, we will try to sort through. Tony, okay. thank you for everything. I don't not to drag us on. It's lunchtime, and I'm, I'm I don't want to slow anybody down. I was at the Charlotte Airport bar when the news broke in that uh, Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson were found murdered or found dead at that point. Nobody really knew what was going on. Uh, so that it, it a long time ago, long time ago. But one of the few times I've flown through Charlotte, I was at an airport bar when that cut in happened. I was returning home uh, with my wife at the time from dinner, all geared up to watch like the second half of the Knicks and the Rockets game six, something like that, whatever game it was. And wow, we were mesmerized for the next eight hours or whatever overnight watching that. Just crazy. Game. Anytime anyone passes away, even if their their 
life is a bit questionable. There is some level of sadness uh, by many, but uh, this is the first one I can think of in ages, maybe ever during my lifetime, where that's not the case, and for good reason. That was during that uh, two-year stretch where uh, the Knicks were gifted, what, two NBA Finals appearances because Michael Jordan yep. was was – Retired, er, serving a uh, gambling suspension, banging around uh, minor league baseball with the Birmingham bats or whatever, but uh, <laughs> on a custom purchase bus that he uh, got for the lads down at Double A. Uh, re retired, er, uh, or no, it'd be a gambling suspension, er, retirement. So you know, whatever. Man, I hit the straight ball very, very much. <laughs> Kids who are under the age of what? 35, 40, wouldn't even know what the hell we're talking about. But, uh, yeah, Michael Jordan, at the height of his powers, walked away from the NBA for 18 months for reasons that still 30 years later remain entirely unclear. And he tried to play minor league baseball in Sports Illustrated very famously, ran a photo of him on the front page or on the cover of Sports Illustrated in spring training, and his bat is at least this far from hitting a baseball like he was a total – swing and a miss. And he, he held that against Sports Illustrated uh, until the end of time after they did him like that with his uh, terrible swing. But uh, I think he got their truth. Damn them in their truth. Yeah. Photoshop before Photoshop. Yeah. He, uh, he did get to play, I think, in one Cubs versus White Sox exhibition game at mm -hmm. Comiskey Park or Wrigley Field, one or the other. Like they brought him up to play one day wasn't even a lie. It wasn't a real major league game. I don't even think there there was an interleague play until 97. So that was an exhibition that he did get to play, I think, once against, you know, uh, a major league team in a major league stadium. But uh, otherwise, you know, why he went and did that, it, it made no sense. And he came back and won three more titles with the Bulls uh, once he returned from retirement. Or David Stern cleared him from uh, his uh, gambling allegations. So. Steve, I know you say you have to explain to people who are under 30 or 40 the Michael Jordan situation. You might also have to explain to them what Sports Illustrated is. Yeah, we'd also have to explain to them why up until LeBron won the COVID championship like three years ago when he really stood on his head and did that. Up until that moment, I was a Michael Jordan believer. But when LeBron did that three years ago in that COVID shell and stood on his head the way he played – and kind of willed them to that championship. I kind of came around to LeBron is probably the greatest of all time. And, and Jordan, believe me, Jordan doesn't take a backseat to anybody. So, you know, you can argue this one, you know, Chicago people, Cleveland people, NBA people, but um, I was a Jordan person until about three years ago. And then I kind of was like, well, this is pretty good. You know, and you compare titles and, you know, Jesus, he was on teams in Cleveland that weren't capable of winning uh, the NBA championship and, you know, butted into some great teams, obviously. But uh, whereas, I mean, he never played with anybody as good as Pippen or Rodman. Uh, LeBron did, at least until later in his career. So, Well, I came around about three years earlier because he did, did take that cast and crew at Cleveland and beat that Golden State. Yeah, that, that, that was a huge one. That was huge. I was blown away by that. No doubt. Great through moment. Time. Overrated. I think we all agree he's overrated. Anyway, thanks, Mark. Peace thanks, Tony. <laughs> Steve, Kevin. Appreciate it. Peace out. Hey, Tom. <laughs>